Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support us on Patreon if you can. There's a link in the description. Everyone watching this channel is giving a lot of thought to the future. Someone who uses science and reason to imagine how the future might be is called a futurist. A futurist believes that we can help shape the outcome of our destinies. The human race is not by nature a rational species. Emotions have evolved to give us a fast approximation of what we should do. These emotions are generated by the cingulate gyrus of the brain in somewhat hardwired but clearly adaptable neuronal circuits that have been programmed over thousands of generations. These circuits were critical to the survival of our ancestors, but these biological systems evolve slowly, while the world around us changes faster and faster. Society has evolved more in the last 300 years than the previous 3,000. In 1720, the fastest means of transportation was the horse, and people fought with swords. 3,000 years earlier, the fastest means of transportation was the horse, and people fought with swords. Then everything sped up. By 1820, we had trains. By 1920, airplanes. In just 50 more years, we had this. No human has ever gone faster than this capsule. This is Apollo 10 returning from their mission to orbit the moon. Inside were Thomas Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan. The capsule reached a velocity of just under 40,000 kilometers per hour before impacting Earth's atmosphere. Since this ship flew, it could be argued that we haven't made a lot of progress in space. We had hoped that the space shuttle would bring down the cost of spaceflight, but it turned out to be too complicated. That wasn't NASA's fault. NASA doesn't get to decide how much money it spends or where it goes. Politicians decide. The prime directive of NASA scientists is to explore space. The goal of the NASA engineers is to build the devices that accomplish that prime directive. The prime directive of almost all politicians is to maintain and increase power and influence. In America, it takes a lot of money to get and stay elected. This money allows you to be louder than your competition. Anyone who gives you money to campaign with get your vote. In the past, this was called a bribe, and it's illegal in most countries. But like the Dred Scott decision that led the United States to civil war, sometimes the Supreme Court gets it completely wrong. In Citizens United, they decided that handing a politician cold hard cash was speech, and to keep that limited, as it had been for over 200 years, was a violation of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which protects free speech. No matter what your political beliefs, you have to recognize that this will not create equitable political access. So politicians get to tell NASA how and where to build a spaceship. After the success of the moon landings, it was determined that for every dollar spent on the Apollo program, seven dollars was returned to the American economy and technology advancements. NASA is a publicly funded organization, and its inventions are available for licensing to the public. The Saturn V had been an incredible achievement. Nothing being built today, not the new Glenn, not the Energia, not the Long March 9, not even Starship, is planned to be more powerful than the Saturn V. The Saturn V could get 118,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Von Braun had developed it, but considered it only a first step to Mars and beyond. Before the Saturn V even flew, Von Braun and his team were looking to develop this. This is the Nova rocket system. The Nova rocket would have been 183 meters long. The first stage would have had 8 to 12 F-1 engines instead of the five used on the Apollo rockets. The plan was to get 450 tons to low Earth orbit. They considered air augmented engines and single stage to orbit, but finally decided that a two-stage system would be best. They were considering both RP-1 and liquid hydrogen for fuel when this was also canceled. Now, Elon Musk is planning to launch the Starship with methane. Methane has never been used in an orbital rocket before. But before you think he's trying something totally new, consider this person. This is the American rocket pioneer Robert H. Goddard. He was born in 1882 and was a brilliant and eccentric man. At the age of 22, he was studying at the Worcester Polytechnic University in Massachusetts, where he designed a magnetic levitation train. His notebooks contain equations for planetary capture by aerial break, meteoroid protection, and suspended animation. 
He argued that humanity could reach the moon with his ideas, but the New York Times published a large article where their expert ridiculed his rockets, arguing that they wouldn't function in space because there was nothing to push against. He built and flew the first liquid-fueled rocket in 1926 using gasoline. He developed gyroscopic control, vanes for steering, engine gambling, and powered fuel pumps. In Robert Goddard's notes, we find that he felt that while liquid hydrogen was the most energetic fuel, liquid methane was less difficult to work with and had the best heat value combinations. But Mr. Goddard did not have his own money. He would try to describe his rockets to the U.S. government and wealthy supporters. But when he built one, they often blew up on the launch pad or in flight. Rich people and governments watching something they funded blow up does not usually go over well. Most wealthy people are dedicated to a fast return on investment. That's how they got wealthy. The concept of rapid prototyping and testing is foreign to them. Robert Goddard was never appreciated in his time. He never received the funding he needed to create the rockets he designed. He lived long enough to watch Germany develop the V-2 rocket and fly it to space. The V-2 was liquid-fueled and used gyroscopic guidance, steering vanes, and powered pumps everything that he had designed decades earlier. He died in 1945, three months after the war in Europe, and four days after the destruction of Hiroshima by an atomic bomb. His estate was able to patent his maglev train idea in 1950, and the first one was built in 1989 in Berlin, Germany, and called the M-Bomb. The simple fact is that it doesn't matter how brilliant your idea is if you don't have the funds to make them a reality. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are as smart as Elon Musk, but almost all of them have lived and died in obscurity. Elon Musk was lucky that when he became fascinated with computers as a child, it was an exceptionally good time to know something about computers. And when he helped develop an online payment program, the internet was just advanced enough to have enough sales to really need one, and no one had come up with a better one yet. If we can credit Elon Musk with any special quality, it is not his ideas. As I said, many brilliant people have great ideas. But we must credit Elon Musk for having the exceedingly rare combination of skills required to be both a revolutionary thinker and a good businessman. Most inventors are not. Edison made a fortune patenting the electric light and other inventions, then lost most of it investing in concrete furniture. I'm sure it sounded like a good idea at the time. Nikola Tesla's inventions make our modern electrical world possible, but many of his ideas remained unfunded and never built, and he died penniless in a New York hotel. Elon Musk is quite different. He is the only person in world history to have founded four separate billion dollar companies. And I guarantee you that when Starlink goes public, there will be five. The one thing that makes Elon Musk exceptional is not that he has great ideas or is rich. What makes Elon Musk exceptional is that he has dedicated his wealth to the betterment of humanity. Not in some vague way where he leaves everything to charities, some of which only spend 4% of donated money on the problem they were created to help. Mr. Musk is dedicating all of his money to these goals. And he has revived a lot of great ideas. The difference is that he has the means to make them a reality. So what Elon Musk is doing in South Texas right now is exactly what Robert Goddard did in his backyard. Building rockets with his own money and testing them until he gets it right. Let's pretend you make $100,000 a year and you have a net worth of $1 million including your home and cars. If you want to have fun, buy this model rocket for $60 and watch it fly. Even if you lose it in a tree or the parachute fails, you're not going to cry. The cost was trivial compared to your net worth. As of this writing, Elon Musk has a net worth of about $158 billion. That means the equivalent trivial expense for him to throw away on a test rocket is $9.5 million. Starship is designed to get up to 200 people into orbit with one launch. To be proven safe for humans, a lot of starships will need to die. Elon will not go broke doing this. For now, they will keep working on the landings until they get it perfected, because no one will immediately want to fly after watching this. 
Let's remember how hard it is to land a large rocket from orbit. It's not just that a lot of knowledgeable experts thought it was impossible. It's that for a while, SpaceX seemed to be proving them right. While perfecting the Falcon 9 landing systems, there was crash after crash after crash. You get the point. People didn't care that much because the rocket had done its job. It had deployed a satellite earning SpaceX millions of dollars. No one else was landing rockets anyway. Landing the Starship is the hardest thing SpaceX will have to do with it. If SpaceX wanted to save money, they could consider focusing on Starship orbital operations before they perfected the landing. The fastest way for SpaceX to make Spaceship pay for itself is to get it reliably into orbit with large payloads. Then try to land it. If it fails, you still made money. That means getting this thing, the Super Heavy Booster, flying dependably. Then as you get the landings down, expand to point-to-point -to -point cargo shipments. Focus on U.S. military resupply, disaster relief, and other high-value cargo. And then start outfitting Starship variants as an orbital laboratory. Use the Super Heavy Booster to place it in orbit, unmanned. Then lease it out to nations that want to engage in orbital science, but don't have transport. Once you have customers, use the Dragon capsule on a Falcon 9 rocket, already NASA certified for crew transport, to dock with and provide crew and scientists to the Starship Orbital Laboratory. The Starship is big enough to contain rotating habitats at lunar and Martian gravity, and SpaceX would gain valuable information on the life support and other systems. When it's time to come back, use the Dragon for the crew and experimental results. Then try to deorbit and land the Starship. If it crashes into the ocean a few times, so what? It has paid for itself financially, and no one is on board, and it will have advanced space science. Over time, the landings will get perfected, and the Starship will start flying into space with future colonists. Just a thought. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe. And Astro Proterra.